生，心转妙法轮，教导我们如何了生脱死，离苦得乐，速证无生。Some God we agree were true, out of compassion, for the sake of this assembly and all living beings, please turn the wonderful Dharma will to teach us how to live suffering and the templates and end birth and death and quickly realize numbers. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Namo Sadanto Suchedoye Allahadi Samya Samputoshe Namo Sadanto Suche Doye Alahadi Sammyao Sambu Doshe Wushang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Qian Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu Wo Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi Yen Jie Ru Lai Chen Shi Yi Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons, but now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Shifu Shangren Goe Shishung Taja Omi Tofo, Venerable Master, Dhamma Friends, welcome to our Sutra Lecture today. My name is Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, June 5th, here in the Gold Coast of Australia in Queensland. It is Saturday, June 4th, in other parts of the planet. And welcome to our Sutra Lecture. We're going to be looking into the Flower Garland Sutra. And the first thing we're going to do is invoke spiritual presence here. And we do it with a melody um, and a banjo. sound yang, full of that yang, strong, bright light. Okay. Also, uh, we want to acknowledge country. Kumbumeri people of the Ugambi language group practice their spiritual connections to land, to living beings, and to all creation in this location for tens of thousands of years. So today we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of this land. We acknowledge them with gratitude as we share this land today with sorrow for the cost of that sharing and with hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together. We acknowledge their wisdom and their elders, past, present, and emerging, 
acknowledge as well all First Nations peoples whose sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, I think we're going to make that peoples, peoples whose sovereignty was never ceded. There we go. All right. We are well and truly underway. Um, we're here in the Dharma Hall at the Gold Coast Dharma Realm. And I want to let you know uh, first, uh, before we begin the lecture, about a uh, program that's going to be happening um, at the City of 10,000 Buddhas, which is the uh, recitation of the Avatamsaka Sutra. And if you want to find it online, uh, you want to go to um, go to YouTube if you can reach YouTube, and you'll find uh, it's uh, C let's see CTTB live. Is that correct? Uh, we'll we'll check that. I'll get you the correct address to find it, uh, and also a Zoom link for you by the end of the lecture. Um, here at the City Gold Coast Dharma Realm, we have. I put it on the screen here. I'll share my screen so you can see it. Here it is. This is uh, reciting the Avatamsaka Sutra here at GCDR. It has begun. They'll be doing it for 19 days, same as City of 10,000 Buddhas. They'll be reciting for 19 days. Um, starting tomorrow, um, the time will be 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., which is 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. in East Asia, Beijing Shijian, Taipei Shijian. Um, then, uh, let's see here, there will be, uh, there are different times during the day when this program is available. So California time is Friday and Saturday, um, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., then six, let's see, three, ten, seventeen. Can't quite tell you what that date is. I guess the tenth to the seventeenth. It is eight thirty p.m. to ten thirty p.m. in the evening. That's Gold Coast time. Then uh, every day from two a.m. to three a.m. California time. So there's a Zoom link here. You can find all this information at gcdr. Dot org.au. Okay, that's going on. Also, I wanted to share with you that tomorrow uh, in the Gold Coast it's 12.30 p.m., so that's noon time, and in California it's 7.30 p.m., that's Sunday night, uh, that's specific time. There's going to be a lecture um, to observe, we don't say commemorate, we don't say celebrate, to observe the 27th annual observance of Master Hua's Nirvana. I'll be lecturing on uh, a topic near and dear to my heart, um, which is Master Hua's contribution to, uh, contribution as a poet, as an essayist, as a songwriter. Um, people know Master Hua in a variety of identities, a variety of, of roles. But not everybody knows about his literary contributions, and he was a major wonderin in in the Chinese way of uh, looking at at uh, monks and scholars. He contributed uh, poetry, essays, couplets, uh, songs, um, teachings, dharma talks, and uh, in a in never-ending stream. Um, some of them are quite historic. For example, Master Hua's uh, verse commentaries to every line of the Sharangama Mantra and the Great Compassion Mantra. Massive contributions. Sri Fu wrote an eight-line verse to match each line of the mantra, which is, I think, in terms of a genre, unique uh, in Buddhist literature. So uh, those are rich and, and wonderful. And uh, going to share my screen again. Um, let's see here. Uh, I didn't, I should have had this ready in hand. Let me wait to the end of the, uh, let's see, hold on. Oh, ah, got it right here. There we go. Share the screen. And I want to show you this. This is 
the book published by Buddhist Text Translation Society, which is hard to come by because most people, it's in Chinese, first of all, it hasn't been translated, but it's uh, published uh, on the Buddhist Texts website. It's called Shang Xuan Xia Hua Lao He Shang Ji Zan Ge Yong Zhuan Ji translates as a uh, Master Hua's co collected literary contributions. It's a boxed set. It's, it comes in a big box and uh, it is a wonderful collection of uh, all of those verses that accompany mantras, lines of mantras, all of uh, Master, Master Hua's verses to um, verses that are uh, praises or critiques of historical figures. Master Hua had a series called Fozu Daoying, the uh, reflections in the Tao of the Buddhas and the patriarchs. And he included in him many world figures as well, uh, through Chinese history, through world history. So uh, he wrote a, a verse for them. And uh, so that, that book, that collection is just priceless. And it's available, as I said, on the Buddhist Text Translation Society website for I think 40 bucks or something, which is quite a bargain because it's, uh, it is a gem. Um, so that's tomorrow, 12.30 here in, in uh, Queensland. That would be 10.30 in Taiwan, in Beijing, in Singapore, Malaysia, I believe, or maybe that would be 7, 8, 7.30, uh, 9.30 in Malaysia. So uh, figure your time. It would be 7.30 on Sunday night. That's the City of 10,000 Buddhas weekly sutra lecture slot. And the occasion is the 27th observance of Master Hua's Nirvana. Just to let you know about that. Alrighty. Now, let's look into our text today. Uh, well, not that one. This is the one we want. Right here. We are, we officially concluded our investigation of the, on here, investigation of chapter 19 of the Flower Garland Sutra. Now we're going to move into chapter 20 and hold on here. Okay, there we are. Here we be, here we go. There's our text. I'm going to say, Ye mo gong zhong ji zan pin di er shi. Chapter 20, Verses in Praise Amid a Palace in the Suyama Heaven. Okay, I'm going to tease you, just give you the title and then pause. Um, why? Because I want to review chapter 19. Here's the story. It was time for the Buddha to deliver another piece of the Avatamsaka Sutra. And his teaching on the Avatamsaka didn't happen at one place. It happened in seven places, nine times. So in the process of explaining the Flower Garland Sutra, Dharma, he traveled. And of course, the first one was beneath the Bodhi tree but now we're into the fourth location and it's in the heavens. So I think I just want to point out if you're explaining from the point of view of a, a Western religious context, let's say the Bible, for example, um, I don't know if in the Bible there's a sense of where where it was spoken, because it's such a historical text. There's all these different speakers and all these different periods of time represented. Um, but in the Avatamsaka Sutra, definitely the, the Buddha goes to the heavens, but not one. He goes to multiple levels of heavens to, to give a different teaching at different places, different times to different beings. So this is our fourth, the fourth visit, and it's a heaven called the Suyama heaven. The Yemotian, sometimes Shu Yemotian. And this is that we spent some time talking about where it is in the Buddhist cosmology. 
we're, we're relying on the Buddha's description of uh, through his wisdom eyes what's going on here. So it's when growing up as a Protestant, uh, heaven was heaven. There wasn't more than one and there weren't multiple descriptions of it. But from the Buddha's perspective, there are six levels of heaven in one realm, 28 in another, and then four in another. And then once beyond the heavens, then you're in the realm of arhats and sages who can travel freely beyond in through the heavens and beyond. And of course, there's also the realm of humans and asuras and animals and ghosts and hells going down. But we're looking from humanity's point of view up and this, there are, we're in now, not the heaven of the four gods, not the heaven of the 33, the triastremsha. We're in the heaven above that called the Suyama heaven. So that's where he is. And what happens? The Buddha announces that he's going to be speaking this Dharma. And one of the, the beings to receive that message is the king of the Suyama heaven, the leader. If, the, if actually we're into uh, platinum jubilees, this is the big deal across the pond is, is uh, Queen Elizabeth II, her wonderful 70 years on the throne. Everybody, not everybody, many people are celebrating, not all. Some Irish folks have other opinions, but all right. So that's, we do have kingly regal language in our realm here among humans. But imagine if you're in the heavens and the God, the leader of the Suyama heaven uh, says, hey, the Buddha's coming, I'm gonna speak Dharma. We're gonna get to hear something that you haven't heard before. So what happens? I'm gonna share my screen. I went through our text and I picked out the miracles that happen in, let's see, let me pick the right, there we go, not that, not, yes, there it is, right there. Okay, first of all, the sutra says, I'm reviewing chapter 19. This is, come on now, I gotta move, there we go, all right. Okay, miracles that happen. First of all, everybody, sitting where they are in their seat, suddenly feels that the Buddha is right in front of them. How has that happened? Yeah, not that one, this one. Remember that? It was, here we go. What happened? It was, those bodhisattvas each received the Buddha's spiritual strength and with that inspiration spoke Dharma without exception each of them felt the Buddha sat directly in front of them. Huh, that's interesting. He wasn't, but they had that feeling. And she whiz, how does that happen? Okay, what else? Without leaving his seat beneath the Bodhi tree, the Buddha said, I'm going to the next heaven to speak the Dharma. Okay, then the world honored one without departing from his seat beneath the Bodhi tree in the peak of Mount Sumeru, headed to the jewel adorned hall in the Davis palace in the Suyama heaven. That's number two. That's a, what you call a miracle. Uh, in Buddhist language, we would say an inconceivable event uh, that is explained by saying, this is what the Buddha can do uh, with his different bodies. And that's what you can do, what I can do when I cultivate to the place where I have functioning simultaneously a Dharma body, a reward body, and transform bodies. Okay, so think about this miracle quote, which is what? The Buddha did something strange with his body, right? So he appeared not just one that I'm limited to sitting here in front of my computer, but the Buddha could somehow affect the consciousness of all of those bodhisattvas and appear in front of them, multiple bodies. Hmm, interesting. Another thing, without leaving his seat beneath the Bodhi tree, the Buddha could travel to a heaven. Again, physical limits are transcended. He's doing stuff with his body that we can't do. How do we explain that? What is the potential of your 
physical body when it's cultivated without the limitation of the self and the ego. Think of how that limits us when all I care about is me and mine. Or even worse, I care about my reputation, which doesn't even exist in reality. It has no concrete reality, but it's so important that to defend my good name or somebody slandering me or scolding me or even dissing me or looking sideways at my tennis shoes or my jacket, right? I feel it's important for me to react with violence, right? How limited we are when every person has this potential to take their body and do things that kind of defy science and physics. All right, there we go. Next, what, what's next? The devas. The devas have an ability, which is the celestial king of the Suyama heaven saw the Buddha approaching, used his spiritual powers to conjure a jewel, lotus, flower, treasury, lion's throne. The next whole chunk of the chapter, look at this, verse after verse, describing what it was like, what that throne was like, oh my goodness, where it came from. So in other words, the, the deva the, who is in charge of the Suyama heaven put a lot of work into preparing a place for the Buddha to sit. <laughs> I think, because why? From that seat comes the teachings. And in this case, this is the fourth of the Avatamsaka assemblies. We're going to get the teaching on what are called the ten practices. Not only the ten practices, but also the ten inexhaustible treasuries, the Shi Hung Pin and the Shi Wu Jin Zang Pin. Both of those pieces of the Avatamsaka teaching are going to come in this assembly from this heaven. So the Deva's working. He's he's putting this seat together. And it's, it is sublime. Can we run through? Uh, what else? Let's say. Million tiers of staircases. A million golden nets. Flower banners. Garland banners. Perfume banners. Jewel banners. Flower canopies. Garland canopies. Incense canopies. Jewel canopies. In the millions. Are all part of this presentation. For the Buddha to sit. Millions of lights illuminated and sparkled. Okay, then it affects the, uh, in, in Buddhist language, we talk about proper retribution and dependent retribution. In other words, what kind of environment? There's the, the material world and the beings. So, deva kings from the heavens, jump for joy, bow in reverence, sing hymns of praise, play music in harmony. Huh. <laughs> I'm like catch my breath here. Flower clouds, garland clouds, multifaceted ornament clouds, covered it on every side. Mani clouds shone forth radiance. Then the next passage here tells us where the uh, where the where the throne came from. How could this be? How could a deva? What does he do? Does he snap his fingers to make it happen? But millions of wholesome qualities supported by millions of Buddhas, augmented by millions of varieties of blessings and virtues, made splendid by vows of the heart, uh, profound resolves, millions of practices, millions of dharmas, millions of psychic powers. And okay, so there, that's our list. In other words, this throne came from invisible energies. All it, look at that wholesome qualities like that's called good roots, right? Um, blessings, virtues, resolves, vows, and practices. Those things don't have any shape or form. They're made from the mind, but they're made from a good mind. My uh, friends in the Iroquois tradition. Uh, the people of the Longhouse, the Haudenosaunee, they talk about the good mind. And it's what keeps people from killing each other, first of all. Uh, because the Iroquois, who's before the white, let me look at everybody. Before the white folks landed on the shores of Turtle Mountain, the uh, 
the human beings in charge of North America, um, wasn't called North America, their, their land went from Wisconsin in the west to the northern reaches of what is now Ontario in the, in the north to the Atlantic coast and then all the way down to Georgia. That was the, the, the home of the Iroquois peoples. And they were, uh, before the peacemaker came, um, Ayanwatha, uh, they were at war with each other. And then the tribes of the Iroquois made peace and they made a constitution that stood for centuries, written down, agreed to, democratically arrived at, that was part of the basis of Thomas Jefferson's writing of the United States Constitution. And uh, the, the thing that allowed this Constitution to be rule of law was the good mind that when people were in their good mind, they would recognize the value of the agreements that they made to stop killing each other and live in peace and harmony and well-being for all. That good mind seems to be in short supply in America these days. Um, so just to say, these, this good mind created the throne that the Buddha is about to sit upon because he needs a place to sit. He's going to be there for a while describing the practices and the, the principles of the Dharma that he's going to explain, the Bodhisattva path in particular. So um, the, uh, it, it's interesting that our sutra says, what does it say? It says, this throne came from millions of wholesome qualities, a good mind. There in Chinese is shan gun, good roots, right? Wholesome foundations. Supported and sustained by millions of Buddhas, augmented by millions of varieties of blessings and virtues, not just one kind of blessing, happiness, and virtues, goodness, but myriad, millions of varieties. It was made splendid by millions of profound resolves and millions of vows. So every time somebody connected to the Suyama heaven um, gave up a bad habit. Every time somebody decided not to get angry. Every time somebody chose to be generous instead of greedy. Every time somebody said, no, I'm not going to go out and break up my relationships or my families just because of this itch. I'm going to count my blessings and be content. Uh, every time somebody was selfless and worked for the community, volunteered in service, it generated this goodness. The deva takes all of these practices and vows and resolves and blessings and virtues and wholesome qualities and transforms them into a throne suitable for the Buddha. Uh, psychic powers, dharmas, all of these qualities came forth and appeared in form as a seat, as a chair. Now, go over your, your house, your living space, pick out a seat. <laughs> Could you invite the Buddha there? Could I invite the Buddha into my home? Om me tofu. Reach for the vacuum and the, the feather duster right away. Yeah. So the throne emitted millions of voices proclaiming the Dharma. How magical is that? The seed itself was a source of principle and teaching. I love it. All right, then, okay, that's the seat. What happens next? We're back with our, our miracles, right? So the king at that point, his job done, bowed to the Buddha, put his palms together and made the welcome. And this is, this is kind of the, the point of this chapter. Welcome, world honored one. Welcome, Sugata, the well gone, the well, well come one and well gone one. Welcome, Tathagata, the one who comes like this, who is worthy of offerings, who's gained right enlightenment. We humbly wish you will favor us and abide here in our palace. There it is. 
That's the, that's the invitation. And then what happens? The Buddha says, I will, I will come. I would be happy to do so. And he traveled to the palace. And here's the next miracle. Here's our miracle. The Buddha accepts the invitation. And at the same time, everywhere, all at once, the same thing happens in worlds of 10 directions. The same events transpire. So we get this mirroring event, this kind of breathing and the one and the many and the, the one goes to the many and the many go to the many and the many go to the many. Like that. So, okay, so now an amazing thing happens, something unexpected. And I pointed out, I took pains to point out that uh, that this is a, a, a god, a deva. This is a dweller in the heavens. And what does he do? He takes over speaking the Avatamsaka Sutra. And, and I think that's worth pointing out that uh, this is a, you know, it's a sutra of which there are many, but it's not spoken by the Buddha. It has the Buddha's inspiration behind it. The Buddha put the whammy, he deputized this Suyama heaven king and said, you're gonna use, you take charge, you get it, get things going and create the space, make the sacred space. This is truly sacred space. We had uh, some of our, uh, uh, actually the, the, uh, the Bhikshu Jinwei, Bhikshu Jinchuan, when they were uh, working in a, a new online uh, COVID time pandemic organization called a pod, right? A new kind of class organization. Their topic was sacred space. What is sacred space? When you go into that place, do you feel different? Could your sacred space be a synagogue? Could it be a, a mosque? Could it be a gudwara for a Sikh style ceremony? Could it be a church? Could it be a temple? Could it be a monastery? Could it be a tree? Could it be the surf? How many people say they see the face of God when they're surfing? Uh, so where is your sacred space? Could it be a closet in your home? or the, the only place that you can be by yourself and not be bothered by the cat and the phone and the, the, uh, the hubbub of the family. So sacred spaces are where you make them. And for example, in Buddhism, the Bodhi tree would definitely be considered a sacred space. Um, and it's called the, the uh, uh, Jin Gang Zuo in Chinese, they say the Vajra seat, the Vajra throne is Jin Gang Bao Zuo, is where the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree. But Master Hua would say that the true sacred space is the, he would call it the square inch. The square inch is your mind, that place where wisdom rises, where you can subdue false thoughts where you decide to hold your precepts and not to break them when the temptation arises, that's the sacred space. So there's an internal invisible sacred space as well as these wonderful external sacred spaces. So, okay, first of all, the Deva's speaking the Sutra. The, he's, he's got his hands on this, he's driving the bus. And what does he do? Totally unexpected. Uh, and I think, significant, important to understand a piece of the Dharma, which is, you say, the Buddha is the founder of the faith, but our Buddha, Shakyamuni, is number four out of a thousand. He's the fourth one in our Alamkara Kalpa, the adorned Kalpa. Our Buddha is not the only Buddha. There's something very democratic happening here, something very impartial and egalitarian, which I really appeals to me. It's that not only can every living being become a Buddha, but when we become the Buddha at the long end of our search for awakening and enlightenment, um, we're just one more in the long line of Buddhas. And it's a long line, historical eons of time. But our Deva says what? He says, welcome. You know what? 
I've greeted 10 different Buddhas before. And I'm so happy that they come because they make this place auspicious. The Tathagata Renown, the Tathagata Jewel King. Let's see, Tathagata Renown was famous throughout the 10 directions. Tathagata Jewel King was lamp of the world. Tathagata Joyful Eye was, had unobstructed vision. The Tathagata Lighted Lamp illuminates the world. The Tathagata Benefactor aids the world. The Tathagata Skillfully Awakened had no teacher. The Tathagata Surpassing the Gods was a lamp for the world. The Tathagata Never Departing was heroic in discourse. And the Tathagata Unsurpassed, replete with every virtue. And finally, the Tathagata Ascetic benefited the world. How about that? So he says, I like this, he says, welcome. I've welcomed Buddhas here before. You're one of many, and you're welcome. Please speak Dharma for us. So then we have more miracles. He says, just as our Suyama Heaven King uh, recalled past Buddhas merit and virtue, sang hymns in their praise, so did kings of the Suyama Heavens in worlds of ten directions. They all praise the Buddha's merit and virtue. So this miracle of uh, one place and all places. Very much like what we think of Indra's net. You know, the image of a beautiful net adorning the <coughs> palace of the king just below, the deva just below, uh, the heaven of the Triascrimsha, heaven, heaven of the 33 gods. There's supposed to be this net in front of the palace made up of pearls, a perfect pearl. There we go. Perfect pearl and interest in just like this. It's translucent and transparent, depending on how you look at it. So each one of the net knots, the interstices of the net, has a pearl right there. And if you look in one pearl, you can see the totality of all the pearls reflected. But all of those pearls return and are found completely in a single pearl. So there's again this one to the many and the many to the one, and the many to the many and the many to the many, on and on. So that's the, that's the idea of this uh, so-called miracle happening here. Okay, the Buddha, the, the chapter concludes as the Buddha enters the palace, takes his seat on the throne, sits with his legs in full lotus, the sutra specifies that. And then the palace goes, it expands wider and deeper. And again, another miracle, just as this happened here in the abode of the devas, so too did it happen in deva palaces in worlds of the 10 directions. All right. So there we are. Um, it's being prepared for the guests who have not yet arrived because there are bodhisattvas who are still on the way. They're still coming. So how powerful is this? Let's do a <clears throat> palate cleanser.
Shave and a haircut, two bits. Okay, we are about to enter chapter 20. Okay, I teased you with just the title at the start, but now we get to start. Here's our beginning. I'll read it to you in two languages. Here we go. Er shi fu shen li gu, shi fang gu you yi da pu sa. Yi just then, with the aid of the Buddha's spiritual strength, a distinguished bodhisattva appeared from each of the ten directions, together with bodhisattvas in number like particles of dust in a Buddha land. From worlds beyond 100,000 Buddha lands, they arrived and assembled together. Their names were Bodhisattva Forest of Merit and Virtue, Bodhisattva Forest of Wisdom, Bodhisattva Forest of Victory, Bodhisattva Forest of Courage, Bodhisattva Forest of Remorse, Bodhisattva Forest of Vigor, Bodhisattva Forest of Strength, Bodhisattva Forest of Practices, Bodhisattva Forest of Awakening, and Bodhisattva Forest of Knowledge. Okay, there we go. So, verses and praise, the new chapter, the chapter 19 that we just finished was about, hold on here. Oh, I forgot to share my screen during that one. Shoot, okay, there it is right there. All right, so forest, uh, let's see here. Um, I keep getting mixed up with whether I'm sharing my screen or not. The um, chapter 19, Ascending to the palace in the Suyama heaven was the prelude. That was the preparation, setting the stage. And now that the stage is set, uh, action begins. The Buddha has come. The Buddha said, yes, I accept uh, the invitation to speak Dharma. And the, uh, we're ready for the the dharma teaching to flow the the waters of dharma are about to flow so who what happens 10 bodhisattvas show up and they come from each of 10 directions and the they come with followers the bodhisattvas arrive with uh, a vast number of bodhisattvas in their following in their gathering so um i like the names did you all pick up on the names. Let's take a look here. These are qualities that the sutra values. And look at merit and virtue, forest. The name in Chinese is Lin, and Lin is two trees. It's a pictogram of two trees, Lin. So merit and virtue is like a forest. Um, I live in a forest here. And the thing about the forest, there are a lot of qualities in a forest. Um, one is the, uh, the presence of trees, obviously. And trees, we're learning a lot about trees as botanists uh, combine with um, ethnologists and archeologists, not archeologists, but uh, um, anthropologists, people who study communities, were discovering that trees talk to one another. And trees may be the largest living being on the planet because their roots under the soil connect. And it's one tree with various uh, emanations of trunks and leaves and branches, etc. So 
what we're discovering is that uh, trees are sentient to a degree that nobody understood before. And we, uh, it's the, the trees are rapidly vanishing is more and more apparent because the, uh, for example, in the rainforest in Brazil, uh, we're now aware the statistics keep popping up of how, uh, how many football fields worth of forested, uh, forest land in Brazil is lost every minute or hour. Three football fields every hour or something more scary. So the, uh, the, the fact that there's so, so little of the original forestation of the planet is left. So now we know as it's shrinking, we can measure it. Uh, so it's a finite amount right now. And the saddest part is that much of the forested land is being cleared in the Amazon basin to make way for what? Grazing land for cows, because why? We love our hamburgers. And in order there to be hamburgers, there have to be cows. In order for cows to thrive, they have to have grassland. Let's cut all the trees down so the cows can eat, so we can kill the cows and ship the meat north to uh, fast food outlets. My goodness, uh, impossible burgers can't come soon enough. Uh, I think everybody agrees. I was listening to a program the other day, a podcast, and everyone had nothing but praise for mock meat burgers that are now available. They're, everybody is pretty much, they said, yeah, they're good, we like them. And if we can substitute plant-based protein for living flesh of cows, then we can save the trees. And if we can save the trees, the planet might not overheat as fast. But it's a race and it's, everyone loses. The cows lose, the humans lose, the planet burns up. So, my goodness. Um, so, yeah, uh, these are forests, and that's the presence of trees is the first thing. And, of course, trees being living creatures, they go through seasons. Uh, they uh, hold, the, they create a sound. The presence of trees, you're aware of trees because you can hear the leaves. You can hear the, the, the trunks in a high wind. Uh, I am very aware of trees where I live because trees are home to all sorts of critters. Uh, the birds that I relate to every day uh, live in the trees. And uh, <laughs> last night, this irony uh, was not lost on me. I have three uh, brushy tail possums that, that visit my feeding station every night. And uh, the, um, they come and I put out some bird seed for them. They like bird seed and I give them, last night it was uh, pears, I gave them some pears chopped up. Usually it's apples or sweet potatoes. They really like crunchy, hard sweet potatoes. And uh, I've noticed that, especially because it's now winter officially here in Australia and their coats are building out but they're getting fatter because they eat pretty good. I feed them okay. And the fatter they get, the, 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 the feeder that they like to get the bird seed because it's, it's safe from other, only one possum can sit on the feeder. And so while they're on the feeder, they're safe from other possums landing on the feeder and taking the bird seed. The problem is that in order to get to the feeder, they have to go up a uh, tibachina, uh, bush and the Tibachina bush is no longer able to support their heavy bodies and and so they <laughs> the fatter they get the more the bush falls and they can't reach the feeder so I was watching this poor possum trying to negotiate because the branch got thinner and thinner but these possums are remarkable in their ability to jump and cling to a very slender stalk and the stalk goes like this and then when it's calm they go up and jump to the next branch well they can't jump anymore because they're too big for the bush to hold them. So, oh my. So I think you ate too much. So now you can't get up there anymore. What are you going to do? <sighs> anyway, watching the critters 
that that allow me to share their their bush with them here in Australia it's bush it's not forest uh, could we translate as bush of merit and virtue bush of wisdom bush of victory I don't know maybe not so these the uh, this it's definitely the forest that brings my encounter with all these animals and birds and insects uh, that have been living their lives happily in the same way for how many tens of thousands of years. Uh, and I, because we're here in the, the hinterlands of the Gold Coast, I get to watch. And I get to interact in a benign way, which is providing a bit of bird seed for them. But what a thrill to be able to, to watch how these creatures live their lives uh, and thrive in a symbiotic relationship. Uh, if you go over to David Flay Nature Park, which is one of our local uh, Australian domestic animal nature parks, they have a beautiful board that shows the rainforest of Queensland and the creatures that it supports and how they all have their part. And it includes brushy tail possums, it includes the, the uh, brush turkeys, and it includes kookaburras, and python snakes, and sugar gliders, another kind of, uh, uh, they're actually, um, they're mammals, but they have pouches. They, they carry their, their babies in pouches. And uh, also the insects that live here, and all the different bird species and all, and they all have their part to, to uh, living in the rainforest. So it's quite spectacular here, but I'm aware that if you go another 100 miles west, you're into a very, very different ecosystem, which is still part of Queensland. It's no longer the rainforest. So here in the forest is a special, magnificent, time capsule of the way the planet came originally and to leave it to go to the city you go to Brisbane and while pieces of it are still there much of it has been altered by the presence of humans so we humans have been the most impact impacted on the our impact on the bush has changed something that has been in place for tens of thousands of years and uh, we're at the very edge of it, just a couple, maybe one mile from where I'm sitting. Humanity has altered it forever, and the species have vanished. And you see an occasional kangaroo come through, and the birds will fly by. But uh, otherwise, it's, it's just not the same. The fabric has been disrupted. So here in the forest, in the bush, uh, I can really appreciate these bodhisattvas, each of whom has the name Forest of forest of qualities and there's one more point here that invisibly in a forest there there is there are qualities that enhance life and enhance well-being peace of mind and happiness there's a reason why when people uh, who are, or when, when you, when I, am frazzled and burned by the pace and the insanity of urban lives, when we get into the forest, there's a healing that happens immediately. There's a sense of, first of all, my skin appreciates the presence of the woods, dark and deep. Uh, I'm aware that my skin breathes differently. The uh, ambient humidity is different. The, uh, the vibrations, you know, this is, is this woo-woo language? Is this hippie talk? I don't think so. I think anyone who would say that hasn't, has been out of the forest for too long. But I know that as soon as I set foot 
in a place where there are trees on all sides, if I penetrate into the forest far enough that above me there, there's green, to the left, to the right, behind and front, there is wood. And the wood, mind you, is only a container for all these processes of sap rising up and the leaves uh, exhaling, you know, oxygen and inhaling carbon dioxide and, and uh, the leaves growing and the flowers blooming and then they're falling and then they nurture the roots and they come back and all timed to the seasons. All of these processes are happening at once. And the trees are also home to spiritual beings. Uh, do I see them? No, I don't. But I truly understand that they are there. So uh, the wisdom of Master Hua, our founder, um, on the campus of the City of 10,000 Buddhas, when a tree was going to be removed for a uh, for construction. Remember when this this first began when we built the Wu Guan Zai Tang, the five contemplations dining hall, uh, in the center of city of ten thousand Buddhas, close to the Tathagata monastery. Uh, we had to cut some of these huge uh, black walnuts, just towering giant trees, and there were also some uh, valley oaks. And valley oaks are Mm, protected in, in California. They're special trees that only grow in our Ukiah Valley strip in this, this uh, through the counties of Mendocino and, and uh, Sonoma and Marin. But these valley oaks are precious trees. And so we had to remove some. And before Master Hua touched the tree, he wrote out a paper, had us write it out. He wrote it in Chinese. We, we translated it. And the paper said to all living beings who inhabit this tree and the environment, we wish to make an announcement. In order to create a safe space for our monastics to eat, for us to carry on our lives uh, in the minimal but sustaining way that we do, we are going to remove this tree on this date at this time and we want to tell you a week or two in advance that this tree will be removed we respectfully request that you find a new home we mean you no harm and we apologize for the disruption that is taking place as we remove this tree and this includes not only the birds that fly here but also the insects that make their home here, and also all spiritual beings, be they ghosts, be they devas, be they spirits, uh, who inhabit this tree and who uh, we would we hope to be good neighbors with you. We want you to know this will be removed. We hope you can find another home, and we apologize for the disruption. <laughs> That's what it said, signed you know, Abbott, City of 10,000 Buddhas. We posted the sign, we read it aloud. Uh, nowadays, it'd be good to read it in Spanish too, multiple languages. Um, posted it up, then recited the Great Compassion Mantra around the tree. To, uh, to show that we really did want to invoke spiritual presence here. We acknowledged the tree was going to be removed, but we apologized and ask that the, the inhabitants of the tree, visible and invisible, all find a new home. So that was how it was done. And since that time, we made that a habit. Um, in Berkeley, uh, outside the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery on Bancroft Street, we have t neighbors two doors down. And uh, one of them is a registered forester, one of, the, one of our neighbors. Uh, a young woman whose uh, father was also a forester. And uh, she had a, a large uh, oak that was going to be removed from her backyard there in Berkeley. It was diseased and it, it was potentially a threat uh, of damage to a neighbors if it fell. So in conversation, she let it be known that that tree was gonna be removed. So we volunteered. We said we would be happy to do a Buddhist ceremony for the tree. And, 
let it know all the beings that have been in this tree because it's been there for hundreds of years that we would love to uh, uh, do a ceremony for it. So we printed out the page, put it on the tree, read it aloud, recited the mantra, and they, the residents were so uh, taken by the ceremony that it made it into the news. They actually took pictures and, and posted it and they said, Buddhists do ceremony for a tree in Berkeley. And of course, there's a lot of folks who would go, oh my God, Berkeley, you know, Berserkly, the People's Republic of Berserkly. But there's an equal number of people who say, isn't that good? I didn't, we should have, we all know that. You know that trees are not just a chunk of wood uh, or the potential chips for your deck. You're logging, you know, panels for your deck or chips for your garden, uh, wood chips on the, the driveway. No, there it's a living, essential being for the well-being of the planet and all its inhabitants. So anyway, that was uh, uh, Forest of Merit and Virtue uh, is our is going to step forward in the next chapter, the Ten Practices, as the speaker, and he's the first one mentioned of these ten bodhisattvas. So forests are more than uh, simply ecosystems. They are refuges for all kinds of beings, including two-footed biped mammals, us, we humans. We do well in forests. We thrive. And uh, there's so much going on inside of a, a forest that, that it, that word made it into the titles of bodhisattvas, 10 of them, and they are the, the speakers to come. They're going to be in our chapter singing verses of praise. They're going to be praising the Buddha. And uh, that's uh, th some of the most memorable verses in the entire Avatamsaka Sutra are coming up in our chapter 20. So I want you all to, uh, to get ready and uh, look forward to our exploration of chapter 20. Alrighty, now at this time, I'm going to share uh, a story with everybody. Um, as I mentioned at the outset of the lecture, tomorrow, uh, corresponding to the evening lecture at City of 10,000 Buddhas, on the occasion of Master Hua's 27th observance of his anniversary, and this is that day in the calendar year is always the most busy, the busiest day of the year at City of 10,000 Buddhas. More people turn out to take part in the, ser the services around Master Hua's demise than um, any other day of the year. Interestingly, buses come from all over California and, Se and Washington State, Oregon, Canada. Yeah. So, Tomorrow, I, I get to do, I was invited to do the lecture, so I thought, ah, here's a chance to share something that I particularly appreciate about our teacher, and that is his uh, amazing ability with a writing brush, or a piece of chalk, or a pen, but often it was writing brush. Uh, Master Hua was a, in Chinese they call him a wanren, he was a literati. Uh, people know him as a lecturer on sutras, as a Chan master, as a Pure Land advocate, as a Vinaya master. Some people know him as uh, someone who did use psychic powers, and all these neat, funny stories that are told about Shurfu that are often uh, stereotypes. Not that many people know about him, about his literary uh, legacy that he left behind. So I want to share a story. Um, I recognize Master Hua uh, probably from the first time when I got a, a detailed personalized teaching, which was my Dharma name when I took refuge. He called me Guo Zhen, the uh, fruit of the truth. And I was so happy that I got that name because I must, you know, be in line for lots of truth. And he said, no, no, it's because you lie too much. You tell too many lies. And he said it just straight, like, you know, it's like, and bonk. 
Uh, it was a, 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 a real teaching and not, it was bittersweet. And I thought, oh, here's a real teacher. I'm going to be taught something. And it may not be, uh, like they say, how yao kuko are li yu bing. Good medicine is bitter, but it benefit it, it aids your illness. It, it banishes your illness. So here's some bitter medicine, and that was my first awareness of what was in store for me. But uh, I have to tell you one particular moment when uh, Master Hua caught my attention in a way I didn't see coming, and this be this event became known as the Mute Speaks Dharma. There's a story that was told and retold. Um, I was the mute because this event took place when I was doing a bowing pilgrimage up to the city of 10,000 Buddhas. Um, myself and my companion, uh, Hung Chao, Bhikshu Hung Chao, Marty Verhoeven, um, were in a place called uh, Pacifica, Pacifica, California, just north of Half Moon Bay. Uh, south south of Half Moon Bay and not far from a place called Devil's Slide, if people know. Um, Master Hua came out to join the laywomen who were offering lunch. And at the time, it was, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Bhikshuni Hung Liang, who was there. She was Susan Anderson at the time, before she left home. It was also a laywoman named Fang Gu Wu, uh, one of the a real sincere lay peep uh, who drew near Master Hua. She's from Vietnam. And also uh, a celebrated author whose name was Xie Bingying uh, who, from China who wrote a book that actually made it into English translation called Woman Soldier. Uh, Nu Bing. Nu Bing. Uh, she, was, she talked about being uh, fighting in the army of the nationalists. Uh, in China, uh, she being a famous book about her experiences. Anyway, there she was. So here's Master Hua, Fang Wu, uh, Susan Anderson, and Xie Bingying. And they came out. There they were. Oh, here's our chance to see our teacher. How wonderful. Hadn't seen Shifu for, for a month, perhaps. And uh, there he was. And so Marty and I bowed to Shifu and, and had lunch. And after lunch, I... This is because here's Master Hua. This is my chance to talk. It was the only talking I did. I have a vow of silence. And uh, unfortunately, my silence didn't extend to the silent mind. I was busy in my mind during this month of bowing, writing a poem in Chinese. I wanted to impress my teacher that I could write Chinese poetry. And uh, is that false thinking? Oh, yes. That's called false thinking. Wang Xiang. So first I wrote it in English, and then I thought, oh, I'm going to translate this in Chinese. And then when I get a chance, I'm going to tell Shurfu my poem. And so uh, that created this event that became known as the Mute Speaks Dharma. And here's, here we are. Here's the event. So, Shifu Master Hua met us uh, with a whisk. This, that's our Plymouth station wagon. We bowed to Shifu, and he whisked our obstacles invisibly off, quite miraculously. Uh, this was this was a, not the same lunch, but anyway, we had lunch. And we were st we were out on the coast. We we gathered by the side of the road and. and the Pacific Ocean was cresting beside us, whoosh. We were actually sprayed by the, the, the waves because where we stopped for, to spread out our tarps by the roadside was right on, just overlooking the waves. So the mute speaks to Yaba Shofa Chi. Now, I came out, I said, Shifu, I, I, I wrote a poem. C could I recite it for you? And Shifu, he got a look on his face, I have to tell you. Our, hold on here. There we go. 
Okay. Master Hua got a look on his face. And he was famous uh, as a schoolboy for being willing to write assignments for his classmates. Shurfu was so good with language, even as a schoolboy, as a, you know, just in his teens, that if the teacher assigned like a matching couplet, for example, and Chinese literature has this genre, this entire genre, where the teacher will give a line of characters, maybe three, maybe five, maybe 12, maybe 15, but each character is carefully selected and the top line will be a statement about something, you know, uh, the, the, the bright moon shines over the azure ocean, you know, something like that. And the student's job is to match that couplet with a descending with the second line. Okay, so the bright moon, he will say the shining sun, okay, shines over. Shining sun lights up azure ocean on the one, the yellow plains. Okay, there's a couplet. The bright moon shines on the azure ocean. The yellow sun illuminates the yellow plains or something like that. So every word has to match perfectly. And it also needs to express a, a sentiment, an idea that complements the, and ideally balances with the first line. That's a couplet. And they're used, uh, if you go into an, a, a traditional Chinese home and you see lines of Chinese characters on both sides of the door, that's a couplet. And their, the ability to write those is highly praised, highly valued. So Shurfu was the best at it. And often he, would, he told us that uh, his classmates who couldn't come up with a matching couplet would go to Shurfu quietly and say, could you help me write that couplet, that lower line? They would ask him to ghostwrite their lower lines. And the teacher caught on to it early and if he looked at the second line, he would go right over and and grab Master Hua by the ear and say, I know you wrote that. <laughs> that student couldn't have written that. That's yours. And they would punish him for ghostwriting the, the bottom lines of the couplets. Okay, so I said, Shervo, I have a poem. Would you look at it? And Shervo got immediately, he got this look on his face that I know those students saw, uh, his classmates saw, which is, the literary mind at work. So what did I say? I said, Shifu, Yan si pian yi jing shu duo, jing shen bao gui, xi you fu, meng zhong zhi yu li zhu nian, jue hou jin qi wei zhong shuo. I said, and I kind of sat back, hoping for praise, right? thinking I was going to get praised. So the last line is duo and fo and shuo. So I got, and the third line isn't supposed to rhyme, but I got three rhymes. And what did it say? It said, words are cheap, but energy is precious. Sutras are priceless and Buddhas are few. Still dreaming, stop talking and do no false thinking. Awakened, speak Dharma with all that you do. That was my original English poem, right? I thought, pretty good, yeah. Words are cheap, right? I'm, I'm a, not talking, I'm a mute, so I'm praising myself. Words are cheap, energy is precious. Sutras are priceless, Buddhas are few. So, of course, setting up the case that we need a few more Buddhas and I value sutras. Still dreaming, then stop talking, like me, and do no false thinking. Are you awakened? Now you can be a bodhisattva, right? That's the thinking behind this. And so, so I, I read the Chinese to Shifu, and what did he do? Master Hua, without pause, he said, hmm, too many false thoughts, he said. He read back my poem to me with three changes and the changes four changes instantly he read my poem back i didn't recite it twice i said it once and he read my poem back but it changed four lines and the four lines were another bonk on the head and also an affirmation of the future and i was absolutely 
Speechless. Okay, here's what I got back from Shurfu. He said, Yan si xu wang jiao bian duo bao gui jing shen ke cheng fu meng zhong zhi yu wu cha nian jue hou yuan lai yi zi mu He said, Now, what was this? He said, Your words are false. Your excuses are many. When you value your energy, you can become a Buddha. Still dreaming? Stop talking. Do no false thinking. He said, that line's okay. I like that third line, he says. But then he changed one word to improve it. He said, awakened? There was never even one word in it at all. So look what he did. I said, yen si shu wang jiao bian duo. I said, words are cheap and yen si shu and Yan si shu wang jing shu duo. I said, words are cheap, but sutras are few. He said, your words are cheap. In your excuses, your words are false. He said, guo zhen, true turning my name back for me. Your words are false. Your excuses are many. Not Buddha. Your excuses are many. I said, Jing Shen Bao Gui. Energy is priceless. He said, when you learn to value your energy, he just flipped him over. You can become a Buddha. Meaning, I don't yet. Right? I don't know how to value my energy. I throw it away left and right. I don't know how to control my six senses. But if I do, I could become a Buddha. Right? And the way he did it was he simply reversed Jing Shan Bao Gui, he did Bao Gui Jing Shan. And it changed the, the, the meaning entirely and again poked, showed me a mirror right to my face. He said, still dreaming, stop talking, do no false thinking. Not bad, he said, that's good. Awakened, he said, Yuan La Yi Mu, which is the Chan exhortation to say just the mind contains all things. Everything is made from the mind. Your nature should be like empty space. Why are you clinging to words, right? So there's the Chan exhortation right there. This is what he did. Yan si xu wang jiao bian duo. Bao gui jing shan ke cheng fu. Which is, you know, I mean, he just took the same words and just put them in a different order and it entirely changed the meaning and gave me this bonk on the head, right? Meng zhong zhi yu wu cha nian. I said uh, wu zhu nian. He changed cha, meaning not the slightest word. He improved it even by changing one word. Then he said, yuan lai jiao uh, hou, yuan lai yi zi mo. After you, you wake up, you'll discover that there weren't any words in it at all. Right? Jing shan bao gui, bao gui jing shan. So that's a teacher. Right, the fact that he he did that in uh, in just w in the next thought, you know, he heard my verse, he spit it back at me, but with the changes that made it just such so uncomfortable and so true, you know. Okay, so you think you're a hot shot? Okay, you just met the master. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> and you could see how you know how Master Hua could. Uh, he could be the uh, the boss of couplets. Uh, so, how amazing to have a teacher like this. Um, tomorrow's lecture is going to include, yeah, truly amazing, I must say. Um, tomorrow's lecture is going to include things like, uh, let's see, not that, but this. Um, oh, not that either. No, nope. where do we go? I want what I'm looking for is this one. Uh, one moment, please. Okay, let's take this one. I have uh, my favorites, and I realize that uh, I'm I'm going to run out of time. I know. Uh, so I may I may ask uh, Jin Yong Shi to for a second opportunity later uh, to do this again because the uh, the verses include such things as 
Jin Shu Kong, the uh, alma mater of Dharma Rung Buddhist University, right? Jin Shu Kong Fo Xing Chong Man Liao. It includes such things as White Universe, Yu Zhou Bai, which Master Hua said is a complete teaching for someone who wants to wake up. And he said, nobody alive today is is ready for the teachings contained in White Universe. He said that will someone will come later who will hear this verse and wake up. Um, uh, that was that is a ci. It's another poetic form like a sonnet, uh, and it's set to Man Zhang Hong, which is a famous ci from the Song Dynasty. So there's that, you know, uh, that incredible teaching. Um, Shifu's poetry includes a whole series of verses to begin a Chan session and verses to conclude a Chan session. So the classic way uh, when you hold a Chan meditation retreat, if you have someone, let me show you my desktop here. Um, here's Who's that on my desktop? This is Master Empty Cloud, Master Xu Yun. And when Master Empty Cloud would start a Chan session, he would always begin it with a verse of exhortation designed for that session, uh, for those people there. And it would be a direct pointing at the mind, um, just like our Song of Enlightenment, right? Directly pointing at the mind. And then at the conclusion, uh, there would be a verse to conclude the Chan session. So Shurfu did lots and lots of those especially in those years at Gold Mountain, when uh, many of our Dharmaster Lai, Dharmaster Chur, and myself, and Doug and Marty, and all of the, the senior disciples were gathering around, first coming around. That's when all these Chan session verses came. So we have a collection of those. Um, we have uh, Shurfu's uh, verses for specific individuals, like the verse in praise of Cardinal Yubin, Paul Cardinal Yubin, the Catholic Cardinal of China, the Roman Catholic Cardinal of China, who grew up in the same hometown as Master Hua. Uh, that tremendous verse is there. Um, if I had had more time today, I was planning to uh, share this story, not that one, but the one um, how at the opening of City of 10,000 Buddhas uh, in 1979, 1980, 1980 um, Master Hua uh, decided to dedicate the what's called the Da Shan Man, the, the mountain gate at City of 10,000 Buddhas, and do the official opening. Three Steps, One Bow had just arrived. Uh, there were guests from all over, including from Kuala Lumpur. Malaysia, uh, guests from what was called Huming Si, uh, Crow Crane Call Temple, um, who came with the Venerable K. Sri Damananda, the uh, from Brickfield's Temple in Kuala Lumpur, the leading Sri Lankan uh, Bante who had come to Malaysia from Sri Lanka to bring the Theravada teaching. They all came to City of Ten Thousand Buddhas, and there are three. Among the collection, there are three verses from that event that Master Hua used to teach all of those um, uh, Dharma friends who came. And let me just share one quickly, the, the, what, the last one of the three. In order to welcome this noble, uh, tall, handsome, baritone voice, Theravada Bhikkhu from Sri Lanka, K. Sri Damananda, known as the chief, uh, Master Hua wrote this verse. And it is a, uh, a teaching for the ages about harmony among the Mahayana and the Theravada. What did he say? He said, Chinan, Chibei, Chidongxi, Mijong, Bei Ren, Tai Ke Xi, Wo Fo, Shuo Fa, Wei Yi Bing. Li Wang Nian Xing Tian Han Yang Shou Muni 
，赫然贯通于一旦，方知团结是处机。He said, "People are attached to being southern or northern, eastern or western. Beings in confusion are simply too pitiful." Our Buddha spoke the Dharma to bring about healing, but those who practice dhyana diverge and get off the track. By nurturing the mind ground, we transcend false thoughts. By cherishing our inherent nature, we guard the mani gem. Then one day, suddenly, realization dawns, and we know that unity is our foundation of support. That was from 1979 at the opening of City of Ten Thousand Buddhas. And in that poem, in that verse,、uh, Shifu does away with the、uh, the habit of Mahayana monks looking down on Theravada monks and Theravada monks looking lightly on Mahayana monks, and showed us back at the beginning of City of Ten Thousand Buddhas what was going to be our legacy of harmony between、uh, traditions. So. Anyway, just to say, there's a whole lot. There's a lot of stuff.、Um, I'm going to invite everybody. See here, if I boot up, let's go to BuddhistText.org. Here is BTTS. I'm going to share my screen. This is our publication website. Go right there for that. And. If you go, let's see here. I bring this up. I want to. There we go. All right. If you go to the bookstore and you go to Chita, there. Here it is, right here. You can order.、Uh, there are copies for forty bucks U.S. of Master Hua's collected literary output. I'm going to talk about this again tomorrow. But it's all published. This is a boxed set. It's a sturdy binding, and、uh, it is just wonderful. All of those verses are in there. Now it's in Chinese only, but we have a a, a challenge to for someone to turn that book into quality English versification. Okay. So again, it's、uh, there. I'll copy. And paste that into the chat box if Jerry wants to pass that on to YouTube. That's how people can find it. If you don't read Chinese, it's not going to be more than a commemorative volume. But、uh, it is a priceless text for those people who appreciate Chan masters who can write outstanding poems,、uh, as well as couplets and essays, etc., etc. So. All right.、Uh, let's see here. We're going to go to Berkeley Buddhist Monastery and let people know. Berkeley Monastery. Can I spell it right? E R Y. There we go. BerkeleyMonastery dot org. Now the、uh, bhikshus、uh, who usually come at this time to talk to us are currently、uh, on break. They're on a retreat. At, in Ukiah at the Sudana Center,、um, and they, I'm going to stand in and talk about、um, what is different. You can check in on the website BerkeleyMonastery.org. Here are the links. You can、uh, take their pre-recorded practices and do them at home if you'd care to. Daily ceremonies are available. Look at those Buddhas. Aren't they wonderful? Those are Ming Dynasty Buddhas on our altar.、Uh, but you can click on those links and get recordings so that you can、uh, bow along or chant along at home if you care to.、Um, Buddha Root Farm retreat is happening in July.、Uh, now is the time if you would care to take part.、Uh, when it is full, that's it.、Uh, go to Buddha Root Farm to find out more information, and you can apply there. And that's pretty much it. Coming up on the fourth Sundays online will be the nuns from Aloka Bihara.、Um, Great Compassion Mantra reciting. I have a sutra lecture on 
Saturday mornings here in Australia, Friday afternoons back in California, 12.30 p.m., on Zheng Dao Ge, Song of Enlightenment. Um, that's available on Zoom. And the monastery is opened again for in-person meditation on Thursdays and Fridays. So here at the Gold Coast Dharma Realm, we have an, an announcement coming up soon about how we're going to reopen with uh, uh, a, a mind, with a thought to being safe uh, during the pandemic. So there we are, by golly. And one more job is to um, transfer merit. Let's see here, let's pick our medicine Buddha mantra. There we are. Okay, here's our mantra, and I'm going to invite you to expand the measure of your mind to send the goodness out in all directions, and uh, see you all next week for the next step into the palace in the Suyama heaven, where we're going to get to hear praises from the bodhisattvas. here and we can make three half bows first bow second bow and third bow bow in respect to the venerable master first bow and second bow All right, that'll do it for us for today. We'll see you all next week.